Hey everyone, how's it going? Thanks so much for tuning in. In today's video, I'll be doing a complete teardown and rebuild of the front suspension in the 89 Chevrolet S10. A while back, I did a video on completely restoring the rear end of this truck. Aside from just doing a suspension rebuild, I also installed a bunch of lowering equipment, I added a sway bar, I also completely restored the frame. It turned out beautifully, so I need to finish all of that work. So I'm going to do similar stuff to the front. I have the rest of the lowering equipment, I have a sway bar, I got brand new control arms, just all sorts of stuff. This thing is going to turn out so, so nice. I also need to jack the body off the frame a little bit so I can make the frame beautiful all the way to the back and change out all of the body bushings, so lots of work to do. If you haven't seen the last video, I put a link in the description box below. It's definitely one you don't want to miss because I test fitted the new powertrain for the first time. I'm swapping in a 350 small block V8 and a built 700 R4 automatic transmission. This thing's going to be a little hot rod by the time it's all said and done. But if you saw the video, you probably remember that when I went to install my motor mount conversion kit, I ran into a little bit of a problem. These plates that attach to the original motor mounts to the frame are actually held in by bolts on this side and nuts on the inside. Downside is there's no convenient access hole to get access to those nuts so you can easily undo the bolts. Now there's all sorts of different you know, ways that you can go about either making your own access hole or figuring out a magical combination of sockets and extensions, but since I'm doing the frame rebuild anyway, it just made more sense to go ahead and drop the front suspension. Obviously, I figured out the motor mount stuff in the last video, but what I didn't show you was the front suspension teardown because that was supposed to be for this video. Long story short, I originally set out to film one video and quickly realized I was gonna have to film like three or four videos at the same time, so you gotta love that project car life. There's just always an unexpected curveball somewhere, but you know what? It's okay. Any day that you can learn something new is a good day. I'm having a blast. I hope you guys are enjoying the series so far as well. We're gonna make this thing awesome. Before we begin, I'd like to extend a huge thanks to O'Reilly Auto Parts for supporting the project. If you guys have any projects of yourselves and need to get some parts on order, check out O'ReillyAuto.com and take advantage of the exclusive discount code SOBKYLE20, which gets you 20% off of purchases of $100 or more. I put a link in the description box below. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Time to remove the wheels. Now for the brakes. <laughs> Next, there's a little dust cap that needs to come off so you can get access to the spindle nut and the outer wheel bearing. Once they're out of the way, the disc should come off. The inner wheel bearing goes in from the back side of the disc. You put it in and then there's a press-in oil seal that goes on top of it. Now for the dust shield. With all of that out of the way, I can start tackling the suspension. The front suspension design differs quite a bit between two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive models. I talked about this some a while back in a video I did of rebuilding the front suspension in my four-wheel drive 93 GMC Jimmy. On two-wheel drive models, you have traditional coil springs, but on four-wheel drive models, you have torsion bars. If you're going to be doing similar work to your vehicle, you have to remember that these front suspensions, regardless of whether it's a coil spring setup or a torsion bar setup, are under a lot of tension, especially the coil spring setup because if you do not secure that thing and take the tension off of it appropriately before you start undoing ball joints and control arms, 
that coil spring can become a very dangerous projectile very, very quickly. If you run down to O'Reilly, they actually have a pretty vast catalog of rental tools. I picked up this coil spring compressor. Basically what this is gonna allow me to do is take the tension off of the spring so I can safely start undoing ball joints and control arms. The first thing I'm gonna do is drop the shock absorber so we can get the coil spring compressor up inside. Before I start loosening up these castle nuts, I'm going to go ahead and install the coil spring compressor tool. The forks up at the top hook on either side of the spring as high up as you can go while the plate sits on the lowest spring and as you tighten it from the bottom, the plate pushes up, the forks pull down and together they compress the spring. There's more than one way to go about removing ball joints. You can get tools that will damage the ball joint but get the job done. There's also tools that get the job done and you know help preserve the ball joint if you were gonna reuse it. But if you have any stubborn ball joints, I found out that smacking a specific area of the spindle or the control arm will actually shock it and make it come out. So right now we're at the point of jacking up the lower control arm to again release a little bit of tension so I can take off the castle nuts completely and then I'll drop the suspension down ever so slowly watch out for that coil spring we'll get that out of there and then remove everything else The outer tie rod is out of the way and the lower control arm is unbolted. I went ahead and left a bolt loosely in the top so when I lower down the lower control arm, the spindle won't fall. Well, there you go. Now for the control arms. The control arms simply unbolt from the frame, but before I can take off the uppers, I need to make note of how many shims are on each side. The shims are these little U-shaped pieces of metal that are put in by the factory for alignment purposes. I just need to take the control arms off and take record of how many shims are per side, so I put exactly the right amount where they're supposed to go. And this is what I was talking about in the last video, those nuts that you have to get off to remove the original motor mount plates that bolt to the frame. The third one is way tucked up in there. In order to properly restore the frame, I want to remove as many things from the frame as I can because it's gonna make the job come out a whole lot better and it's gonna make it a lot easier because I don't have to dance around and work around various components. So I'm actually, in this process, gonna be filming a couple other videos as well. First off is a steering system rebuild video. So as you can see, I've already gotten rid of all of that stuff. I'll be covering it in that video. There's gonna be some really important upgrades going on as well as a little bit of work on the interior. So keep an eye out for that video. I'm also going to be taking the body off of the frame so I can finish the frame restoration all the way to the back. So basically this is like a DIY frame off restoration if you will. I'm also gonna be replacing all of the body bushings 
and undercoating the whole truck with Spectrum from Second Skin so we get some added sound deadening. I am also toying around with the idea of repainting the firewall, but again, all of that is coming in future videos. Just wanted to give you guys a heads up. So let's get back to the frame restoration in this video. Since the body has to come off the frame anyway, there's a handful of things that need to be undone on this side. But with the frame restoration, again, I'm trying to get rid of as many things as possible for the moment, so I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect these two brake lines. In case anybody was wondering, the reason why they're coiled up like this is to give them a little bit of flex because it's a body on frame truck, and if it's rigid from here to here, as everything moves, it could possibly crack a line, so that's the reason for all of that. So I'm gonna undo these lines at the top. The front one goes to the front brakes, the rear one goes to the rear brakes. There's also that parking brake cable that I need to undo, and at some point, there's a wire harness that runs to you know, the back of the truck for all the lights and stuff. That needs to come out as well. With that last brake line out of the way, I went ahead and pulled out the forward portion of the parking brake cable, which, like you saw earlier, goes through the frame there, travels back a little bit, and comes out to the middle portion of the frame, where it then will connect to the cables for both sides. Now, the last thing I need to take off here is the wire harness that goes to the rear of the truck. It ties into this thing right here, which is called the bulkhead connector. You have multiple wire harnesses going into this one connector, and the one we need is right down here. It connects up there, so we have to unscrew this first, and then unclip the harness. At this point, the only things holding the body to the frame are six cab mounts. The original bushings and hardware actually look really nice, especially considering they're 30 years old. There's no major cracking that I noticed, not a whole lot of rust. There's a little bit on the front hardware, but that's to be expected because you got all the junk being kicked up from the front tires. But I have all new bushings and hardware to go back in the truck, but it just goes to show this truck was already a fantastic starting point for this project. All right, let's get to it. Well, fast forward a little while and the frame is all finished. I kind of had to speed through this process a bit and not worry about filming it quite so much because we've been having some crazy weather fluctuations in North Carolina lately, which is not unlike North Carolina, but one day it'll be 65 and beautiful, then it'll be 35 and freezing, and then another day it'll be like a monsoon with thunderstorms. So I've been kind of dancing around the weather and I don't want any more unnecessary content delays because I'm really, really looking forward to firing this thing up, and I know you guys are too, so trying to get to that point. But in case anybody was wondering 
about the process to get this beautiful finish on this frame. I did basically a five step process. I sanded it down like you saw, and then I washed everything actually, I forgot about that. So took some Dawn and basically bathed the whole frame in the shop. It was a tremendous mess, it took forever to clean up, but it was worth it. Then sprayed some rust treatment on it to kill the remaining rust, sprayed some self etching primer, then bed liner, and then once that cured a bit, I finished everything off with engine enamel with ceramic. It's like Ford semi-gloss black. It just has an awesome finish. It's easy to apply, and I just love this combo. This is what I actually did on the rear suspension, or the rear of the frame in the rear suspension video a while back. Now everything matches. It looks better than new. All right, the firewall and the underside of the cab has been layered with sound deadener. I also painted the firewall to give it a nice finished look. Of course, I'll cover all of that in the next video. Now, the body's back in the frame with brand new bushings and hardware, and I can finally turn my attention to rebuilding the front suspension. Just a quick recap, in addition to rebuilding the whole suspension from scratch, I'm also lowering the truck about three inches in front and four to four and a half inches in the rear. And since this is an extended cab with a two-piece drive shaft, at some point before I hit the road, I'll also install a pinion alignment kit to make sure everything stays aligned where it needs to go. On top of all of that, I'm also installing sway bars. Of course, this wouldn't be a restoration without some brand new hardware as well, so the entire front suspension is gonna be brand new down to the nuts and bolts. First things first, I'm gonna start fitting the new control arms. So I went down to O'Reilly and got some brand new AC Delco control arm assemblies already put together and ready to go. They have ball joints and bushings, they're powder coated. It looks really nice. So as far as a convenience factor, this is fantastic. But if you wanna save some money, of course, you can disassemble everything yourself and install the new ball joints, install the new bushings. It takes a little bit of time and it's not fun, but the option is there. In case anybody was wondering what the little things were that I was hammering in, they're basically lock tabs. I took an extension and a 24 millimeter socket, which fit the outside of that perfect, so I can give a nice even smack and lock it in place so that will prevent the bolts from spinning as I tighten down the control arms. Now let's toss the lowers in. Another nice thing about these control arms is that they come with brand new castle nuts, grease fittings, and cotter pins. As you can see, I went ahead and installed the drop spindles and the lowering springs. I've removed several sets of springs from other vehicles in the past, but this is the first time I've actually gone around to installing some, and I'm still new to all of this, so between getting everything lined up and using the compression tool and all of that, I started to get a little overwhelmed with filming everything, and I wanted to make sure I was doing things right because, let's be honest, Working with coil springs is very dangerous because there's a lot of tension right there, so you have to be very, very careful. So one of my friends that has a lot more experience with that came over to give me a helping hand. Thankfully, I was on the right track, but it never hurts to make sure. I also installed a brand new bump stop in the upper and the lower control arms. I may have to trim that one down a little bit. I'm not sure until the truck gets on the ground, but that's that. One thing that I am kind of concerned about that I also won't be able to know fully how it's gonna work out until the engine is in the truck and it's sitting on the ground, but with everything unloaded like this, the edges of both front control arms are touching the spindle. Like, I can move them a little bit, but like this one, I can't turn left. That one, I can't turn right. So they're, they're kind of locked in this straight position, which, I'm not sure if that's a defect or not. I called Belltech and they said that this should level out fully with no clearance issues. 
once everything is on the ground and done, so I will update you guys later on that. Now it's time to fit the sway bar. My truck did not originally come with sway bars even though the mounting holes are present and accounted for. This is going to make a huge difference in how the truck drives because it was a little wallowy beforehand. I've already put a sway bar in the rear so we can go ahead and finish this up. We've got the instructions, we've got all new hardware and polyurethane bushings so we are ready to go. So it turns out that even though there are holes in the frame to mount a sway bar, those holes were not threaded, so I had to cut my own threads. I also had to modify the metal bracket that holds the bushing. I haven't done this one yet, but the holes were a little too far apart from my factory location, so I had to bore them out a little bit closer to the bushing. Um, not much at all. Like I said, I haven't done this one yet, but now it fits perfect. It turns out the tabs on the bottom of these shocks are significantly wider and actually thicker than the ones used on the factory control arms. You can just see the differences right there. So in order for these to be able to fit in the pocket underneath the lower control arm because they go in like this and then you bolt it up, I actually have to cut these back a bit. And there we have it. Well, if you haven't noticed already, I missed one very crucial step in putting all of this back together. And it was the primary reason I started filming multiple videos in the first place. And that's the motor mounts. So the way these motor mounts attach to the frame is that you have bolts going through the frame and on the inside you have nuts holding it all together. So the holes in the frame are not threaded. Because of that, to really get access to them, you have to drop the coil spring. So when I was test fitting the powertrain, I talked about this. In order to install these 2.8 V6 motor mounts, I had to get all of that off, so I went ahead and dropped the front suspension because I knew I was gonna be filming this video. So, long story short, there's a lot of stuff to think about when doing these videos, and I just completely forgot. So, <laughs> that was a mess, and I was not about to tear this front suspension back down. A lot of people in the S10 community suggested that I make myself little access holes, and I really appreciate that advice because it really paid off. So, as you can see, I have a small hole right here, basically mirroring this hole, which is for the fuel lines. I've got one back here too, it's just a little dark, but you can see the edge of it right there. Basically, this allows me to get a 15 millimeter closed in wrench. It's a bit of a stretch to get to that one and that one, but it works. And then I can put the flanged nut in the closed in wrench, hold it in there, and torque the bolts in from the top. I basically drilled out two holes, one here, one here, to about 11 sixteenths or so, and then I took my three inch cutoff wheel and cut it at the top, cut it out of the bottom, and pulled that little section out. I just can't figure out for the life of me why GM designed it like that in the first place. I mean, the serviceability of the motor mount is just terrible. And apparently, or as so I've been told, in the second gen, they actually did put threaded holes in there. So at least now, it is accessible. You know, you don't have to take out the whole front suspension. So everything is still super strong, nothing is compromised, but the convenience factor now is just off the chart compared to what it was before. 
Well, everyone, that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you all enjoyed. Please don't forget to leave a like below. It really helps the video a lot. And if you haven't subscribed already, consider doing so because there's a lot more content where that came from. I'm wrapping up these multiple videos. So over the next week, expect some content around undercoating the cab and the firewall, replacing body bushings, rebuilding the steering system, doing some stuff on the interior and more. So I'll be posting updates on the social media platforms when I know those videos are going to go live. Of course, a big thanks once again to O'Reilly Auto Parts for all of their support. Don't forget, check out O'ReillyAuto.com and take advantage of the discount code SOBKYLE20. I'll see you guys on the next one. Take care.